If you have something you would like to ask or comment on, feel free to raise your hand in the menu below or just go ahead and put it in the chat box. And for those of you watching on Channel 9, you could send an email to info at townofhamilton.org as listed on the slide, and we'll have someone monitoring that inbox to answer your questions. Um, the project team members here tonight are, of course, myself from NJDOT. And from Sam Schwartz, we have Samantha Donovan and Steve Wong. And Samantha, take it from here. Okay. Hi, everyone. Happy Monday after a four-day weekend. It's tough to come back a little bit, right? Um, but all of our caffeine should have kicked in by now or slowly be wearing off. Wearing off. Um, so today we're going to go over uh, the recommendations that we have so far for the Bicycle and Pedestrian Master Plan. There are three main types of recommendations that we focused on. It's going to be sidewalk recommendations, uh, bicycle facility recommendations, as well as intersection recommendations. Um, after we get through all of these, we will go over some of the next steps for this project and then we'll have time for a Q&A at the end. As we go, if you think of questions, feel free to put them into the chat, but just know we will probably wait until the end to answer them. So first up are the sidewalk network recommendations. So on your screen right now, you're going to see our sidewalk inventory and assessment map. And on the left are the roadways that are existing in Hamilton that currently do not have sidewalk. Uh, the other portions that are shown on the sidewalk inventory map are sidewalks in good condition, fair condition, or poor condition. Um, for this report, we'll focus mostly on these roadways that do not have sidewalk. Um, when looking at these roadways, some of them, it's the full length, but for the vast majority of these, it's small portions that are missing sidewalk. And recreating or, uh, you know, connecting those two sidewalk points is going to be really important to make sure that pedestrians can get to all the destinations that they want to get to. Um, when looking at all of these different portions and determining which sections are um, uh, should be prioritized. It's important to look for the different desire lines or the faded, faded uh, worn paths that you might see in the grass. Um, those will show areas that pedestrians are currently walking and a pedestrian facility is needed right now um, to make sure that those uh, pedestrians can get where they're trying to go. Another area that we are also going to be looking at for the final report that isn't shown on this map, it's not included in the priority corridors that were identified at the beginning of this study, is up on Old Forks Road and Walnut Street. Um, we want to focus on connecting that residential area over there with the high school. Um, there is currently sidewalk at the residential development, but between that development and the high school um, and also the elementary school there down below, um, there are like sections where there is sidewalk for a little bit and then there isn't sidewalk and then there is and then there isn't. So making sure that those students that are going to those schools have a safe route there is definitely um, a point of focus as well. So the next portion is gonna focus on bicycle facilities. This is probably the largest portion of this presentation. If you were on the last public information center, we went over some of this information, um, but now we're going to go specifically into the locations that we're looking at each of these facilities for. So there's six main types of facilities that we are recommending. They will go from least protection to most protection. Um, so first are the shared lane markings or share rows. Next, we have the advisory bike lane, then the conventional bike lane. After that, we have the buffered bike lane, the two-way cycle track, and the shared use path or off-street path. Um, again, these go from least to most protection. And usually you'll see that the roadways will go from lowest speed to highest speed. Oh, we got a couple people in the waiting room. Let me just let those folks in. Um, lowest speed to highest speed and lowest volume to highest volume. So this is our bicycle network map. This shows the same roadways that you saw on the sidewalk inventory and assessment map. These are the priority corridors. On this map, you'll see our recommended facility type for each of these roadways. 
Um, this is just our recommendation. Within the final report, there will be other alternatives for these roadways. In most cases, we uh, are showing the highest protection facility option, um, but there are also lower protection options that could be applied on the vast majority of these roadways as well. So for example, where you see advisory bike lanes, sharrows could also be implemented. Where you see a buffered bike lane, conventional bike lanes could also be implemented. There is flexibility in each of these. So first up are the sharrows. So we're gonna go through some of the pros and cons for each of these types of bicycle facilities. And then again, as I mentioned, go through the specific locations. So for Sharos, the pros are that they reinforce the legitimacy of bicycle traffic. Um, it also positions riders in the appropriate place in the lane. So when these markings are painted on the roadway, they're painted in the spot that a bicyclist should be riding on. It also encourages riding in the correct direction. So a lot of times when there aren't these shared lane markings, bicyclists may choose to ride against traffic um, when they should be riding with traffic. So these lane markings um, show them that they should be riding with the traffic. Sharrows will also help with to maintain the existing parking. So because sharrows don't take any roadway width away, um, they just add the marking to the roadway. Anything that's existing, including the parking, will remain as it is. And of course, a con to sharrows is that it doesn't provide a dedicated separate facility for bicyclists to utilize. They are still sharing that roadway with the vehicular traffic. So we are recommending Sharrows on 2nd Road, Egg Harbor Road, Fairview Avenue and 13th Street, Main Road, and Moss Mill Road from Whitehorse Pike to the Hamilton Town border. So now we're gonna click through each of these. As you look at these, you'll see the screenshot of the roadway itself, along with the recommended cross section in the top right. You'll also notice as we go through these, all of these roadways have very similar characteristics, which is why they're being given the same facility type. Um, you'll also notice that they have similar speed limits, they have similar widths, um, they have similar uses surrounding them, and stuff like that. Okay, so the next facility type is the advisory bike lane. Again, if you were on the last public information center that we hosted, um, you, we went over the full explanation of what an advisory bike lane is and we also showed a video. Um, so again, for anybody who's not familiar with an advisory bike lane, um, these are used on low speed, low volume roadways um, where there are two uh, travel lanes existing. There isn't quite enough road width to put a conventional bike lane. There's not enough space to have two travel lanes and the bike lanes there. Um, so with an advisory bike lane, you take the two travel lanes and you take some of the space dedicated to those away and provide them or take them and put them into the bike lane. As you can see on this roadway, the bike lane stripe is dashed. That means that the vehicle can go into that area if needed, if no bicyclist is present. So if there's two oncoming cars or one traveling in each direction at each other, um, the roadway, the travel lane width has been shrunk so that they can't go past each other without going into those bike lanes. So if there's no bicyclist present and there are two oncoming cars, the car can move into the bike lane, um, allow the vehicle to pass and then move back out of it. The pros to the advisory bike lane is that it does provide a dedicated space for bicyclists and because it's narrowing the travel lane, it does provide traffic calming to the area. So it will slow vehicles down that are traveling on that roadway. The con is that because it's not widely used in New Jersey at this moment, it may take drivers time to get used to. Um, but there is signage that can be put along the roadway to help explain to drivers how they should be utilizing it. And once uh, drivers use it a few times, they figure it out and um, it becomes normal and more common. So advisory bike lanes are being recommended on First Road from County Road 640 to 12th Street on Broadway and on Park Avenue. Again, we're gonna click through some of the examples here. You will see similarities in these roadways. Um, you'll also note that in the cross section, there is no center, yellow center lane. Um, so even though it's existing on these roadways, if restriped with advisory bike lanes, the center line would not exist anymore.
which the uh, center line is not currently on Park Avenue. So that's what it would look like with the addition of the striping for the advisory bike lane. The next bicycle facility type is going to be the conventional bike lane, um, as you can see in the photo to the right. Again, it provides a dedicated space for bicyclists to use, um, but it does unfortunately in some cases eliminate parking if it's existing because of the space it's taking away from the roadway. We are recommending bike lanes on First Road from 12th Street to 15th Street and on Chu Road. So as you look at these, it doesn't appear that there's any existing parking on either of these streets. So in this case, the parking would not be eliminated because it doesn't currently exist. Um, but you can see different from the previous roadways that we've looked at, these roads are wider. Um, they have the space to implement a bike lane. And also just as a side note, the cross section that's in the top right corner does show these as painted green. They don't have to be painted green. That'll be up to the town or the county, uh, whatever the roadway jurisdiction is when they're implemented. Uh, they of course can be painted. They do not have to be painted. And here's Chew Road. Next are the buffered bicycle lanes. So the pros are exactly the same um, as a conventional bike lane, except for the added protection. Um, so the added space that the buffer provides between the bicyclists and the vehicular traffic. These buffers can be painted like they are in this image or they can be physical buffers. So whether it's plastic bollards or planters, any other type of physical barrier can also be used as a buffer. And again, similar to the bike lanes, there is the potential that parking would be eliminated with the implementation of a buffered bicycle lane. So we are recommending a buffered bike lane on 12th Street. As you can see, this roadway has even more space than the uh, roadways before, uh, allowing for the buffer. The last bicycle, last bicycle facility type is a shared use path. Um, so a shared use path provides a dedicated space off street for both bicyclists and pedestrians. Um, so these are used on usually the highest volume, highest speed roadways um, that very few bicyclists would feel comfortable on. The cons to these are that they are higher impact. So they have higher impacts to the existing right of way. They may have impacts to existing utilities and they may be higher cost as well. So we're recommending a shared use path on Moss Mill Road. There is an existing one from Egg Harbor Road to Lakeview Drive, um, which we do have a few recommendations to improve that existing one, but then we would also like it extended from Lakeview Drive out to Whitehorse Pike. So as you can see, this is the existing one. Um, it's great. It looks like it's very well used. There's a park right there. Um, the only comment that we would have on this shared use path is that the buffer used is a little bit unconventional. Um, so we think it would benefit Hamilton to use a more conventional buffer that's safer for bicyclists. Because um, this one, if a bicyclist were to run into it, um, it would be very detrimental to them. It's not super safe um, and a plastic bollard or a planter like mentioned before would be safer for them. And this is the portion of Moss Mill Road that would benefit from the extension of the shared use path. We would definitely recommend that it stays on the same side of the roadway so that bicyclists and pedestrians wouldn't have to cross unless they're trying to get somewhere on the other side. Um, and then for it to be extended through to the White Horse Pike. So those are all the bicycle facility types and all of the roadways that we are recommending them on. Um, next up is the bicycle parking locations. So based on feedback from the interactive wiki map and our knowledge of the destinations within Hamilton, these are the locations that we would recommend additional bicycle parking to be implemented. Um, these are for the most part major destinations in the downtown. Um, they are schools and they are some of the parks and recreational areas within town. If there are any other destinations that you can think of that would benefit from bicycle parking, feel free to let us know and we can add more to this map. Okay, so the third type of recommendation are the intersection recommendations. So the first intersection we're gonna look at is the intersection of Route 206, US 30 and NJ 54. 
Um, this is a picture of the existing intersection, and there was a pedestrian crash in one portion of this intersection um, that we took note of when considering these recommendations. So this is what we would like to see. Um, we would recommend the installation of pedestrian signal heads and push buttons on all four corners. There are not any existing currently there. Um, we would also recommend ADA compliant curb ramps, additional sidewalk installation. So that's on the northwest and southwest corners where there are huge chunks of missing sidewalk. Um, also curb extensions on all four of these corners just to tighten up the curb radii a little bit and discourage anybody from making those turns a little bit too quickly. Um, and then an installation of a crosswalk on the eastern side of US 30. So there are existing crosswalks, as you saw on the previous image, on all other corners, all other sides, but the one was missing uh, where the pedestrian crash occurred. Oh, and now, oh, there it goes. Oops, Sam, just go back to that one real quick. Sure. <clears throat> and and the, main, the main improvement here is eliminating the slip lane from uh, US 30 to 206 uh, on that um, north east quadrant. Um, you know, when you looking when you look at the existing, um, you're you're requiring pedestrian to cross both through the slip lane, stop on the the small narrow pedestrian refuge island, and then continue on. So the I, the goal here was to eliminate that slip lane. Um, you know, yes, there may be some impacts to traffic flow, um, but you know, this is a pedestrian safety project. And the goal here is to slow cars down as they are uh, making that transition and give pedestrians an opportunity to uh, cross. <clears throat> uh, one other thing that we would also recommend here is the installation of a leading pedestrian interval. And, and what that does is it, before the signal changes, it allows the pedestrians to cross into the intersection or start crossing into the intersection, you know, five to seven seconds before traffic starts moving. And what that, what that does is it allows the pedestrians to establish themselves in the crosswalk and um, makes them more visible to cars that are turning. So uh, that's another improvement that we would recommend here. The next intersection that we looked at is the intersection of Vine Street and Egg Harbor Road. Um, here in this area are two existing bus stops, and this also is an area that the town has been talking to NJ Transit about uh, for the potential of putting a bus turnout into one of the uh, empty parcels that are right by the bus stop. Um, so for this area, we are recommending the installation of high visibility crosswalks to get pedestrians across Egg Harbor Road. Um, we are also recommending the installation of ADA compliant curb ramps to go along with those crosswalks, um, as well as the installation of a rectangular rapid flashing beacon um, to get pedestrians across that roadway. So they would be at both of the crosswalks across Egg Harbor Road. Um, these are pedestrian actuated. So when a pedestrian pushes the button, uh, the lights will flash to alert cars to their presence so that they stop um, so that pedestrians can cross. Uh, we would also recommend the installation of a textured intersection to just further increase that awareness. The next intersection is very similar to the last. It is the intersection of Cherry Street, Line Street, and Egg Harbor Road. There is also a bus stop. Um, I believe there's two, but you got it's blocked by my cameras for all of you. There are two bus stops here um, within the proximity of this intersection. And again, you're going to see the addition of high visibility crosswalks, ADA compliant curb ramps, rap, rectangular rapid flashing beacons or RRFBs, real tongue twisters, and the installation of a textured intersection again. So the main goal here is to get pedestrians to and from these bus stops safely um, and to wherever they're going afterwards. The next intersection and probably the most complicated is going to be Central Avenue, Third Street and Vine Street. So these are the existing conditions of this intersection. Um, 
as you all probably know, this intersection can be a little bit complicated to get around, and it's also home to the town clock. So we have three different alternatives that we're going to be looking at for this intersection. The first is going to be closing off a small section of Vine Street right here to extend the existing plaza that the clock sits on um, and take some of that roadway away from the ve vehicles and give it back to the pedestrians. Um, so this will allow for additional park space or um, additional seating for the businesses in this area. Um, and of course, all of these recommendations for this intersection would require additional study to ensure that the traffic impacts um, aren't too great when closing this portion of the roadway. So the second alternative, very similar to the first, is closing off a portion of Third Street to take back even more of that roadway to give back to the pedestrians. And again, similar to the first, it could be used for park space or um, seating for restaurants nearby, or you all close down a portion of Central Avenue for different festivals. It could be moved to that portion of the street instead. Um, so it would be a more permanent setup for any activities that happen in that area. The third alternative is a roundabout. Um, so this would involve closure of Vine Street in the north, and it could also involve potentially closing off uh, this portion of Third Street. Um, so this, this area could be used again as a plaza if, if wanted, or if any parking is removed because of the roundabout installation, parking could be moved over into this area as well. Um, so you can see in all three of those alternatives, the clock stays in the same spot, um, could be moved slightly, but it'll still be there. Um, and again, all of these would require a little bit of additional study um, to implement, but it's a great spot for a roundabout and you can see the different areas of sidewalk that would be um, either increased a little bit or slightly decreased in other areas. There would be right of way impacts um, if a roundabout was implemented. So just to kind of follow up on <clears throat> what Sam is talking about here, these these are concept sketches. Um, you know, they're they're not fully engineered, not fully designed, and and also not fully studied. But this can give you an idea of what the area can look like. Um, the roundabout portion itself is is to scale. Um, you know, so it, it's it's designed to a certain point, um, but really what we're trying to show here is that yes, it can fit. Um, the impacts to the right of way, we moved it as far to the south so that if there were going to be impacts, they would be incurred by the municipal building and the, and the land that it sits on to avoid taking property from um, private, res uh, private owners and things like that. Um, and in this case, we're showing closing off the portion of third, but that doesn't need to be closed off. Um, but we thought that, again, given uh, the different fairs and festivals you have and when you close down Central Avenue, creating that extra space, extending the park just to the, the, bottom, uh, the bottom right, uh, you kind of expand that park, you can reclaim it as green space and allows for, you know, um, making, making town hall sort of a focal point or a gathering spot for the community, um, creating a pedestrian plaza or something like that. Um, you know, yes, you would maybe lose the nine on street parking spots there, but, um, again, you can also make that up in other places. Um, but you know, again, things like farmer's markets or, or programmed, um, live music concerts, those are all sorts of things that will attract people to the downtown. Um, and, and, you know, it's close enough to be close to all the uh, restaurants and things like that. So um, we think this would be a nice treatment to uh, make, make town hall sort of the, the center point. So 
So those are all the recommendations that we have to present tonight. Uh, some of the next steps for this project is the report. So we'll be working on the draft report, um, pending any feedback from this meeting and incorporating that into the recommendations first. Uh, the draft report should be ready for review the end of December, early January, uh, followed by the comments we receive from the draft. We will be finalizing it in late January, early February. Um, and now it's time for anybody with questions. So again, you can submit them in the chat box, which I will try and find my chat box on here, or you can submit them through the email, info at townofhamilton.org. And while we're waiting for people to kind of, you know, ask questions or just kind of have a chance to think about what they what they've seen here tonight, um, you know, with things like the advisory bike lanes and um, e even with Saros, you know, we would also recommend that there be some non-infrastructure related programming, you know, to educate the community on how to use those different facilities if they've never seen them before. Um, and especially the advisory bike lanes. Um, you know, again, it's, 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 it's new, but it also kind of points to um, you know, the, the town making the decision to be more walkable and to prioritizing other modes of transportation aside from just cars, uh, right? So we're creating a dedicated bike facility and really we're asking the cars to, you know, share space instead of the bikes sharing space with the cars, the cars are now sharing space with each other, leaving space for only the bicyclists. Um, and again, you know, when there when there are two vehicles passing each other, um, then yes, they can move into the bike lane, but only if a bicyclist is not there. Otherwise, they need to slow down and wait, and you know, let the other people pass. So those are just some some of the thoughts behind the advisory bike lane. But again, a lot of it comes down to providing that education piece to it as well. Uh, when we do things like this, we we think about. Well, four E's really, uh, you know, some people call them five, six, seven, but it really it's engineering, right? So we want to design something correctly. Um, we want to educate the community. So that's a second E. Um, we want to encourage them, people to use it through some of the different programming um, and having some, some sort of outreach to encourage people to use it. And then finally, um, enforcement, the, the fourth E. So we want, you know, to test the, you know, the roadway users to say, hey, you know, there are penalties for not obeying traffic laws. So, you know, we kind of look at it from, from that standpoint where we're looking to, you know, with engineering, uh, education, encouragement, and enforcement, those are how we change behavior of, of um, the motoring public. Um, okay, so a couple of questions here. Will the draft of the report be available to review? Um, generally, it's that we'll have that reviewed by the steering committee, um, and you know we can talk uh, uh, amongst ourselves to determine whether or not how we make that available to the general public. The the um, you know the concern there is just having everyone kind of comment on it and being able to. Um, uh, Get comments in back to us in an orderly uh, manner. Sorry, Dan, did you want to comment? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I well, yeah, you know, I I always have a comment. Um, <laughs> but um, a couple of questions. One in in terms of uh, actually Alyssa's uh, question about uh, will the reports have budgetary info as well. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that the the report with the recommendations will basically lay out, um, I hate to use a, a pun, but a kind of a roadmap of where the town wants to go in the future. And it would really be up to the town to pick the kinds of improvements and the priorities that we would uh, want to do first, second, third, et cetera. And then we would have to work out the the costs as we look into them, is that correct? Co correct. So what we will have in the report will be an alternatives matrix uh, and really an implementation plan. 
and the implementation plan will provide the town with order of magnitude costs for items. Uh, and what we typically do is, you know, we will, we try to work with the town to say, okay, um, we know two roads going to be resurfaced in the next two years. Okay, so instead of restriping it back the way it was, we're going to restripe it with our improvement. And so the differential, um, the, the cost differential wouldn't really be significant, right? We always try to piggyback these bike ped safety projects into larger reconstruction projects. The plan that we're developing, this master plan for Hamilton, the goal is not to make immediate improvements. The goal is to think about or, or to present what we, the vision of the community is over time. It's a planning document, right? So we're looking at in 20 years, here's what we want our town to look like. We want it to be more walkable and bikeable. So it doesn't mean that you need to budget hundreds and thousands of dollars to do these things, you know, immediately. The, the idea here is as projects come up, um, like the resurfacing of Route 54, um, as they come up, the, in, in that case, the municipality, I'm sorry, the state is doing that resurfacing. You now have your recommendation on record as the town. Here's what we want that to look like. So when they're doing their due diligence and determining, okay, after we resurface it, does the community need, do they want something different than what was already out there? In this case, they'll look at the master plan and say, yes, they wanted bike lanes. And, and so that's exactly what happened, right? So as they, um, they're planning to install bike lanes on 54 when they do the resurfacing project. Um, but that holds true for county roadways or roadways that are maintained by, by, maintained by Hamilton. Um, when Public Works is going out to resurface a street, they can refer back to the master plan or that Im implementation matrix and say, oh, okay, on this one, we want to install shadows. So instead of, you know, so then you're just adding the cost of the paint, essentially, and maybe some signs on, on the road when it's resurfaced. So um, from a budgetary uh, standpoint, the answer to that question is yes, we will be giving order of magnitude costs for certain things, um, but also we will be providing um, an opportunity for the roadway, the people who are responsible for the roadways to take a look and say, oh, okay, here's what they want. Okay, let's try to, let's implement that the next time we do a, a maintenance project or a reconstruction project, um, we can build that into it. Um, we will also be including um, a list of different grants that are out there. So it's public money that's available, um, you know, and, and actually um, Cross County Connection, one of the, one of the representatives from uh, Cross County Connection is the Transportation Management Association for the area. They, they put together a really nice um, I guess it's a report or, or, or a brochure about all the different types of grant programs that are out there, right? So grant equals free money to the town, um, but they're really competitive. And, and by, by knowing how to um, write those grant applications, um, you get a better chance, you have a better chance of being awarded them. And what this report does and will do is provide that information so that the town should just be able to cut and paste into those grant applications. You know, why are we doing this? Can you document the need here? Um, how, you know, who will it help? And you can provide, we'll be providing all that information. So really um, it should make applying for those grants a little bit easier. Um, you know, so we talked about connecting the high school and the elementary schools with sidewalk. Um, safe routes to school grants are available um, and transportation alternatives and enhancements grants are available through the state. Uh, so um, from a budget standpoint, yes, those things are available uh, and will help put the town on the road 
to use that pun um, to the future. Um, can you put the map back up? Uh, Jim Bacon asked that we please show, I'm not sure which map you want to show, but I get, why don't you put up the, uh, the bicycle uh, network map, Sam? Sure. Uh, and while Sam is working on that, uh, Bob asks, since many of the bike and ped corridors involve state and county right of way uh, roadways, have they been contacted for review and comments? Uh, yes, both uh, sit on the steering committee for this project. Bill Revere is the DOT representative and uh, the county has been represented by uh, their planner, John Peterson. Um, and I, uh, I believe he was at not at the last pick, but at the last stakeholder uh, steering committee meeting, um, he provided some guidance with regard to which roads and the type of roadways they would accept narrower, tra narrower travel lanes um, to install bike and pedestrian facilities um, and some where they won't just because they know that the traffic volumes are higher, there are higher truck traffic volumes as well um, so they they have w within the county they have their own requirements for um, lane width and things like that so uh, yes the county the, the idea is when we do these types of projects we want to get all the stakeholders involved um, so that they're involved in that decision making and alternatives development process from the beginning um, when we talked about <clears throat> uh, talking about new, talking with New Jersey Transit about the bus turnout. That was something that came up uh, and, and that's how we started talking to New Jersey Transit. New Jersey Transit is on our steering committee as well. So they heard when that was brought up um, and are, are, they are looking into it and you know what it would take. And for, for them, a lot of it comes down to, is there enough space? They have certain design guidelines that they need to um, adhere to to allow for buses or in some cases articulated buses uh, to pull in and then be able to pull out. Also, um, <clears throat> there needs to be the proper spacing for loading and uh, alighting passengers and those kinds of things. So, um, but that's certainly something that we can, uh, that we're going to continue those conversations and uh, working with the town as those as those ideas kind of percolate and come together, hopefully we'll have those decisions in time for the draft, but we're okay making those, you know, we can make those changes continually up until we issue a final report. Um, and at which time, you know, I would think that uh, transit can work with the town directly to, you know, develop some sort of ideas or plans for how they can incorporate the turnout into what the, the town has in mind. Um, okay, so then the next question was also from Bob, or I guess it's a comment. The town received DOT Safe Routes to School uh, funding for sidewalk along portions of North Street, Fourth, Walnut, and Old Forks. Great. So you're you're already there. Um, uh, those are the types of improvements that we were kind of talking about. There are there are sections where it's either a vacant parcel or a parcel that's under construction um, of just in, you know, filling in those network gaps uh, so that you know, school kids or even other people just kind of out going for a walk can have a continuous walk along the sidewalk and feel comfortable and safe about it. Um, are we going to have a map or a post where we can share it with the community? Um, of these maps, yeah, I, this, we, well, we are recording this, right, Sam? <laughs> so the, our presentation is going to be uplo uploaded to uh, the town website where uh, all of our materials have been. We can certainly post, uh, provide uh, PDF copies so that people can look at the still image and not have to hear uh, Sam and I talk about them um, so people can look at it and comment on them, so for sure. And on the website, we'll also provide um, a questionnaire or a, 
a, a comment card or feedback form so people can let us know what they like, uh, especially where we have different options like, you know, by the clock, you know, do we want to see a small improvement or do we want to see something larger like the roundabout idea? Um, do we want to close that little portion of Third Street or not? So that's where um, we're looking for feedback from the community to let us know which, again, this is your plan. So which one do you, of those do you want to see? Um, if we have cons comments regarding some engineering for the intersection modifications, uh, certainly, can we discuss those <clears throat> the future by phone or email? Absolutely. <clears throat> um, all those intersection improvements, uh, again, these are just, th these are concepts. And, you know, there may be some of them that you don't feel comfortable with. Um, you know, you may not want a roundabout there, or you may not want to close certain portions of the roadway. Um, you know, let us know, right? Again, this is your plan. When we're looking at it, we're looking at it from a, um, ultimately, what is going to be the, the most beneficial for pedestrians and, and, and cyclists. There's always a balance, right? The, the idea is we need to balance bicycles, pedestrians, motor vehicles, um, truck traffic, transit, we need to balance all of those modes of transportation. So the idea is, you know, only you can tell us what we should be prioritizing. For me, I always opt to make it safer for bikes and peds, but that may not be what Hamilton needs or wants. So, uh, you know, again, we always want, we always need the feedback from the community and, um, so, you know, I, I encourage you to share this with your friends and talk about it. Um, the, more, the more input we have from you, the better it is. Um, let's see. Uh, on some county roadways where solid uh, edge of pavement striping exists, would that be changed to skip striping where needed to allow for bike traffic? <coughs> So in some cases uh, where that edge of pavement line exists, um, depending on the treatment, if we're adding shadows, uh, no, that edge of pavement line would still stay there. Uh, but if we are changing it to the advisory bike lanes, um, yeah, that edge of pavement line would switch and would be moved um, to accommodate a five foot wide bike lane with the skip striping. So, you know, it, it kind of depends on, it depends on the recommendation that we're, that we have for that particular corridor. Um, and then I also want to add that if you, if when we, when we started talking about when Sam was talking about the types of improvements, um, you know, I think it was important to say, these are typical type improvements for these typical types of roadways, because just because we didn't look at it doesn't mean that the town as a whole can't decide, you know what, this road would be great if we can add shadows to it as well. We know this road is, you know, people like to ride on this road, so let's make um, a bike lane or something like that. So depending on the type of roadway based on the width, the volume, um, the posted speed limit, these types of improvements can be applied to other roadways that are similar, that have similar characteristics. So I just wanted to, you know, just because we didn't, you know, we can't look at it, we don't have the, the, uh, the budget or time to look at every single roadway. So this is really a roadmap, um, to steal Dan's term, of how you can make these improvements to other roadways in town, um, just kind of by copying it and placing it in a new location, as long as the roadways are very similar. Uh, where am I? Looking around the train station and Lake Park, any recommend any recommendations for 11th Street from First to South Egg Harbor Road? Um, we will have to get back to the group on that because I don't know that road specifically. 
Um, but I'm sure there's something we can work out. Sam, why don't you start, uh, go through some of the next ones and let me see if I can find uh, the street that the question is. Sure. Um, so the next question we have here is, or maybe it's a statement. I really like the idea of a dedicated buffered bike lane on 54, but how would you recommend handling parking with a bike lane along Bellevue slash 12th Street, especially through the central downtown area? Um, so we do also, even though we presented it today as um, like we took one screenshot of the roadway and then gave you the recommendation for it. We do have cross sections drawn up for each section as it changes. So there is a cross section that shows the parking on 54 um, that we didn't show specifically. Um, in most cases, and I believe it's true for this roadway as well, um, when there is parking existing, we have recommended that it goes you know, sidewalk, curb, bike lane, parking, vehicular traffic. So the parking will serve as the buffer in that case uh, between the moving vehicular traffic and the bicyclists on the roadway. Um, and then depending on how much space, and again, I can't remember exactly how much space we were looking at on 54, um, we do in some cases recommend a small buffer between the bicyclists and the parked vehicles to help avoid the opening of doors into bicyclists. <laughs> so wherever possible, we do also like to do that as well even though the parked cars serve as a physical buffer. Um, okay. okay, so I, I did find 11th Street between uh, 1st and South Egg Harbor Road. Looks to be about a 30 foot wide roadway, um, but it also looks to be very residential and um, probably very low volume roadway as well. So in that case, you know, we can look at something like either Sharrows or advisory bike lanes. Um, Steve, and not to interrupt, but Bob did just put a comment in there about a bike path that they are, that they have under contract that goes along 11th Street. Oh, okay, even better. So then you can find a, uh, uh, an off-road facility which is, again, we always look for the most protected uh, application of, uh, of, the, uh, of bicycle facilities. Right? The goal here also is to make facilities that all, the, all, all cyclists of all abilities will, will feel comfortable on. And you know, having a dedicated facility by themselves without having to worry about cars, um, you know, makes people feel safer, especially uh, less experienced and or younger riders. So we will add that portion of bike path to our uh, bike network map so that it's shown as part of the network. Um, Bob will get the specific um, segment from you after this meeting so that we can add it. And uh, sorry, Sam, I missed the, the, the talk about the buffered bike lane on 54. Um, yes. So, and I, I don't know if you, you said it, but you know, sometimes what you can do is also have the bike lane against the curb and then the parking on the outside. Did you get there? Yeah, that's what I said. Oh, okay. <laughs> We're on the same page. It's great. Yeah, I just, I just <laughs> uh, was too busy l looking for 11th Street and trying to get my computer to work right. Yeah, and I, I really like that uh, that arrangement. We've we've seen that suggested in um, uh, a couple of complete streets um, workshops, and uh, I think it it really it helps to protect bicyclists. It still provides cars with enough room for parking and stuff, and uh, wouldn't um, I don't think negatively affect people parking downtown and and you know patronizing the downtown businesses, but would help to bring more bicyclists into town more safely. For sure. Um, 
we one one thing um and this uh we haven't really addressed this and and uh, i don't know that we will per se in in this uh exercise but um i was thinking about uh, i know over the years people have <clears throat> pardon me suggested that uh, the town purchase various parcels of of properties to uh, increase the amount of open space we've got preserved through the town and also uh, move to to link those with paths bike paths bike path pedestrian paths running paths um, combined use paths i guess um, through through town from one border to the other say from um, say from Winslow uh, through the town to over to, to Mullica um, I don't know will you be looking at at potential areas for that or would we need to suggest possibilities how would you handle that issue no, I, I think for for the master plan I think you know we would cover that just by saying you know there there is a goal or a desire to make those connections um, I don't think we would be able to uh, develop an alignment um, yeah. within the scope of this because you know that you know kind of requires looking at who owns what properties and things like that yeah. um, so you know and then that is pretty time intensive because you're you're then spending time digging through through uh, plat maps and things like that that may or may not be you know electronic and things like that so um, I, I think if if, the, if that is the goal of the town um, yes we can certainly do that I think in our bicycle network you know the idea also is to look at connections to um, your neighbors um, you know making connections to some of the other areas that are that are near that are near Hamilton that other people may want to be um, may want to take advantage of. So, um, you know, I know some of the, the, the wineries are just outside and, um, and certainly, you know, we talked about early on making connections to some of the outlying um, rural, or I should say um, farm areas and things like that. <clears throat> but again, that's where I was kind of going with um, the, the different types of treatments can be applied to different types of roadways so that as you say okay well we want to make connections to here you look at that 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 typical cross section that roadway just like i did with with 11th street you know you look at it you look at the width of it you look at the traffic and the and the volumes and the speeds and then you know it's pretty it, it kind of narrows you down right you start with is there room for you start from the most protected is there room for a shared use path no okay how about protected bike lanes no how about regular bike lanes and you keep going down until you find the ones you know you work backwards to find the application that best suits you and in some cases it comes down to one or two um, but maybe you know if you're looking at the right-of-way um, as opposed to just what's within the pavement so if, if you're if you're if you're cartway where the vehicles travel where there's where there's current pavement is only 30 feet but really you have five feet of right away on each side then maybe you want to extend that pavement to create the bike lanes with that extra room so you know those are just it's, it's really methodical how you think about it so um you know what what's good for the road what really worked out well is that the roads that we kind of looked at and our core our priority corridors they're very indicative of a lot of the different types of roadways that you'll experience within the town. And applying one concept to the others will, again, you know, it, it'll help you complete your bicycle network um, even after the plan is complete, yeah. the formal plan is complete. You know, uh, Steve, you mentioned um, the wineries that, that brought to mind um, we have a, a craft beer trail, and um, I think there's a winery trail also. Um, um, maybe you could look at that and see if that has any impact on, on um, 
streets or roads um, to make uh, improvement recommendations for. And uh, Cassie, I don't have the actual website uh, link in my head. Oh, you're on mute. DowntownHamilton.com. There's a, the front page has the bike trail and it would just show you the simple route. The only thing that might change is three threes, but it's not worth getting into. The other craft breweries are all there. Three threes might be moving, but um, they would still be in the downtown. Okay, great, great. I mean, that's something to take a look. I don't know if that has an impact or not. And I would, I just would add that. Um, great suggestion. That, you know, we don't encourage people to ride their bicycle while intoxicated. Yes. Well, I, it, it could be, a, it could be a, a beer craft walk trail. I would agree. Yes, perfect. Would agree. <laughs> All right. Does anyone, any other questions? Did anything come in through? Um, the last comment there from Bob is new. Okay. Uh, if there's a bike path along Moss Road, review the intersection of Whitehorse Pike and Moss Mill Road to provide for a safer uh, uh, ped crossing. Sure, we can certainly take a look at that. Um, Denise, did any any other comments or questions come in from the uh, info at townofhamilton.org? All right, does anyone else have any other questions or is anything? Is there anything that you'd like us to uh, show or review? I think it's looking good. All right, well, um, if there are no other questions, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, stay dry, I, I don't know what the weather's doing down there, but it's, really pretty nasty up where I am. So uh, stay dry, stay indoors. Don't let your dog escape like mine did just before the call. Uh -oh. um, <laughs> Thank you guys. You guys did a great job. You do a very nice job with your work. Thanks. Appreciate that. Great. Great. It's, easy. it's easy when we have great people to work with. <laughs> All right. Yeah. On that note, everyone have a great night and um, um happy holidays if i don't talk to you between now and the new year great thank you you too bye Thanks, everybody. take care everybody